In 1944, residents in the town of Mattoon in Illinois came under a prolonged series of attacks by a man the papers named as the Mad Gasser. Despite the witness accounts that claimed to see a man stalking around the victims' houses on multiple occasions, the authorities and subsequent psychological studies chalked the whole saga up to nothing more than a case of mass hysteria. But did that diagnosis really answer every question posed by the evidence of events that ran for over two weeks, as summer faded over the small farming community? Or was it just a convenient outcome for a police force with no answers to give the troubled population? This is Dark Histories, where the facts are worse than fiction. Hello and welcome to Season 4, Episode 3 of Dark Histories. I hope you're all doing really well, as always. I'm Ben. Today we've got kind of a famous episode, I guess. One of the more popular stories, maybe. Um, but I, I was I was reading about something completely different and I, and I just sort of came across this one and I just thought, you know what, I like this story and I think there's a bit more to it than kind of on the surface, like a little bit more, sort of, if you, if you dig into it, I think it could go a little bit deeper. So I looked into it more and it was it was really nice. So, I, so I, yeah, I picked it for this week. And there was definitely research to be done that I, I certainly didn't read in any of the books that I read. I'm going to say thank you to all the patrons who signed up since last episode. Thank you so much for your support and all the patrons that have always supported or, or if you have supported in the past and you've stopped, thank you very much for your support. Uh, this week we got Raina, Luan, Okay, this is going to catch me out. Demi or Demi. I'm, I'm never sure which one that is because I'm a moron. Uh, Jessica, Matthew, Leslie, James, Brandon, Richard, Truly, Danielle, Gerald, Janet, Janine, Sean, Amy, Terry, Paul and Russell. Thank you very much for your support. It goes a very long way, um, probably further than most people realise, I think. Or maybe not. Maybe you'll realise, but yeah, it, 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 it's a, it's very, very helpful. So thank you very much for that. There's not a lot else more to say in terms of housekeeping and that. So let's just jump straight into it. This is the Phantom Anesthetist of Mattoon. Situated 100 miles to the southeast of central Illinois, Mattoon was a small rural blue collar town in 1944. Dominated by farmland and a small handful of factories, the largest of which, the Atlas Imperial Diesel Engine Company, had relocated to the area nine years earlier in 1935. Whilst the war saw many small towns boom with the influx of labour drafted into work in the industrial sectors of the US war machine, Mattoon's relatively small industry only saw moderate growth and the population remained stable at just below 16,000. Even after the secondary boost from the discovery of petroleum reserves in the ground outside of the town. 1944 had been a tumultuous year for much of the US. Abroad, the war in Europe and Asia was headed towards a positive conclusion, and popular sentiment was generally upbeat. The landings at Normandy had seen an offensive in France that had concluded with the liberation of Paris from the Germans, and the momentum was firmly in the Allied powers' favour. At home, Americans were recovering from one of the largest flu epidemics in history, followed by a particularly rough storm season throughout the spring in many areas and severe drought in others, which had caused huge losses in the farming sectors. Politically, the public were gearing up to elect a President Roosevelt, whose health was rapidly deteriorating for a record fourth term. The labour market was suffering from shortages of manpower and industrial strike actions, although still outpacing the German, British, Russian and Japanese output combined. The year too had seen the largest sedition trial in US history, with 29 American citizens, mostly right-wing oddballs, standing trial for having Nazi sympathies and charged with conspiring to undermine the morale of the armed forces. Despite the fact that the trial is seen as a somewhat farcical now, and though the trial itself never concluded, having been brought to an abrupt end when the presiding judge passed away, it nevertheless worked to sow the seeds of fear and paranoia into the average population concerning one's neighbours, especially those seen as outside the political or social norms. 
This fear had been exacerbated late that summer, as press reports claimed that the Nazis may have been planning gas attacks on American soil in retaliation for the D-Day landings. In Mattoon itself, around 5% of the population still lived in homes with no electric, whilst around 50% had telephones connected to the communications grid and owned a new fandangled invention known as the refrigerator. Radio and newspapers were still the main source of news, both local and on the war, and the local newspaper in Mattoon boasted a 97% readership coverage of the town from Monday to Saturday. As the first week of September dawned, seeing the closing of what had been a mild summer in Illinois, a new, somewhat unique threat burst onto the scene in Mattoon, one that would remain as a staple in psychological studies on mass psychogenic illness for decades to come. It was 3am, the early morning of September the 1st in Mattoon, Illinois. Midnight had long passed and streets were deserted. Even the din of the local factories had fallen quiet for a few short hours. 47-year-old Urban Rafe was in bed with his wife, Pauline, when he woke suddenly feeling nauseous. Instantly, he felt something in the room was not quite right. There was a peculiar, heavy odour in the bedroom, and I at first thought it was gas. He rolled over in bed and woke Pauline, asking her if she might have left the gas stove turned on earlier that evening. Though after waking slowly and assuring him she certainly had not, she too began feeling queasy, and both herself and Rafe realised that a feeling of paralysis was creeping up through their legs. The couple spent the next hour and a half being ill, until as quickly as it had developed, their feeling of sickness faded. The next morning, they checked on their guests who had been sleeping in another room to see if they had smelled anything or had any sickness in the night. But when they confirmed that they had not, both Rafe and Pauline put it to the back of their minds. That was, at least until they read the newspaper on that Saturday, the September the 2nd. Below the large block letters on the front page that read, Yanks in Germany by nightfall was a second headline, not any smaller, and this one hit a little closer to home. Anesthetic prowler on loose, Mrs. Kearney and daughter first victims. A prowler who used some kind of anesthetic or gas to knock out his intended victims was on the loose in Mattoon Friday night. Mrs. Kearney and her three-year-old daughter, Dorothy Ellen, were victims of the anesthetic on Friday night as they slept in bed at their home, 1408 Marshall Avenue. Both had recovered today, although Miss Kearney said that her mouth and throat remained parched and her lips burned from the effects of whatever was used by the prowler, who was unsuccessful in getting into the house. Aline Kearney went on to describe the attack, and importantly for Urban Rafe, she described the sensations that she felt throughout, which he recognised immediately is exactly the same as the sickness and paralysis that he and his wife Pauline had felt on the Thursday night previous. I first noticed a sickening, sweet odour in the bedroom, but at the time, I thought that it might be from the flowers outside the window. However, the odour grew stronger, and I began to feel a paralysis of my legs and lower body. I grew frightened and screamed for Marta. She came into the bedroom, to which the door had been closed, and asked me what was the matter. I told her of the sensation I had, but I was unable then to move from the bed. Martha Reedy, who had come to Mrs Kearney's aid when she had heard her scream, noticed the peculiar smell in the room as soon as she entered, and she rushed over to the Robertsons next door, asking them to call the police. The police showed up and joined Mr Robertson, who had been scouring the area around the house, but had come up with no signs that anyone was lurking around, and no evidence of any attempted break-in. With little else that they could do, the police and Mr Robertson reassured Mrs Kearney that they didn't see any threat of an attacker in the vicinity and they left her to rest and recover from the attack. Around 30 minutes had passed and Mrs Kearney was already feeling significantly better. Bert Kearney was a taxi driver in the town and had been working late that night. He returned home after word got around to him from the police that his wife had been attacked earlier that evening. He left work early and parked up by the curb at around half past midnight, only to see, to his horror, a tall man wearing a fitted cap and dark clothing standing outside his house, staring in through the window. He 
jumped out of his car and chased after the intruder, who had already taken off as soon as he had seen Bert, but as he turned the corner of his house, the man had gone, disappeared into the night. Bert called the police to the house for a second time that evening, but once again, their search was in vain. No evidence could be found of an intruder, and the man that Bert had chased seemingly made a clean break. As Mrs Kearney and her daughter were now recovered from the earlier attack, the police once again left them to sleep, which, after driving over to their friend's house on the other side of town to spend the night, thankfully came quickly and lasted the couple and their children through to the morning. Urban Rafe continued to read the report in the paper of the Kearney attack, which speculated that the attacker had used either chloroform or other, or possibly a combination of the two, and sprayed it into the sleeping victim's room. It was an uneasy feeling to think that he too had suffered at the hands of the so-called anaesthetic prowler. He picked up the phone and called the police to give them his own report from the morning of the first. If he was worried that the police might think him a crackpot, or of creating stories out of thin air, he needn't have been concerned, because he wasn't the only one to have called police on the morning of the second after the paper had printed their headline. Shortly after the Kearney assault, two other households had suffered similar attacks. Mr and Mrs George and Beatrice Ryder had phoned the police to confirm that she too had smelt a pungent odour that had made her light-headed and made her children restless, whilst a further unnamed victim living a few blocks west from the riders, had called police to report that she had awoken to the smell of a sickly, sweet odour and found her children suffering from sickness and vomiting. Within a few hours on Saturday morning, the anaesthetic prowler had gone from a case of a strange and unique attack to a thoroughly frightening series of attacks throughout Mattoon. Police, who originally thought the attack on Mrs Kearney had been a failed burglary when she told them that she'd been counting money in her home that evening and she believed that it would have been possible to have seen her in the process from the street outside, were left to scrap their earlier theories where none of the other attacks seemed to fit with the theory at all. Talk had already begun to spread throughout the town and as darkness crept over the horizon that Saturday night, it was an uneasy population that slept on beneath the inky black sky. Over the next few days, peace and quiet returned to the town of Mattoon. With Labour Day falling on Monday the 4th, newspapers had an extra day out of print, and as such, news on the anaesthetic prowler had faded away, as talk returned to more normal daily affairs. Upon the resumption of circulation on Tuesday, however, the uneasy peace was quickly broken. The prowler had been at it again over the weekend, and had made the front page news once again. Anesthetic Prowler adds victim, Mrs. C. Cordes, burned, ill, two hours. Mrs. Balula Cordes and her husband Carl had returned home the previous night at around 10pm from an evening out and having parked up, they entered their home as was their custom through the rear entrance. Setting down in the lounge, Balula noticed a white scrap of cloth fluttering on the front porch through the screen door. In an act of curiosity, she walked over to it, bent down to pick it up and unfolded the cloth, which was a relatively large square. As she did so, she noticed that in the centre of the rack was a damp patch, and instinctively, she put the cloth to her face to sniff the unknown substance. When I inhaled the fumes from the cloth, I had a sensation similar to coming in contact with a strong electric current. The feeling raced down my body to my feet and then seemed to settle in my knees. It was a feeling of paralysis. My husband had to help me into the house and soon my lips were swollen and the roof of my mouth and my throat burned. I began to spit blood and my husband called a physician. It was more than two hours before I began to feel normal again. Meanwhile, whilst Balula Cordes had been resting and recovering from her ordeal, Mrs Burrell was suffering under the hands of the anaesthetist. At 11.15pm, Just over an hour after the Cordeses had returned home, Mrs Burrell had woken coughing and choking on fumes in her bedroom. She struggled from bed, collected her young infant son in her arms and ran over to her neighbour's house where she called her husband George and then the Mattoon police to report the attack. Once Balula Cordeses' symptoms began to subside, 
she decided to scout out on the porch and the area outside of her house for clues as to what the intruder may have been up to. She had a suspicion that the chemical on the cloth was possibly chloroform, intended to put the family's dog to sleep, allowing for a robbery that was fortunately scuppered by her and her husband returning home, frightening the would-be intruder away. As she combed the area out front of the house, she picked up two items which she thought might have been dropped by the intruder, a worn skeleton key and a tube of lipstick which had been almost entirely used up. Back at the police station, Police Chief Cole sent the cloth to the Illinois State Police Laboratory to be analysed. However, the large gap in time between recovering the cloth, sending it off to be analysed, and the actual analysis happening, which was delayed for over 60 hours, left the police feeling entirely lacking in confidence that any eventual test would yield much of a conclusion as to the chemical that may have been used. The only lead the police had on the case was reported in the paper and it made dismal reading for any of the town's population that may have been looking for a boost in confidence with the local law enforcement. A man had been picked up shortly after the events at the Cordes house. However, he had been released after a short bout of questioning in which the man explained that he was not loitering, he was simply lost. A hideout was also vaguely mentioned that the police had decided to check out, with suspicions that it may have been frequented by the anaesthetist but they found nothing to confirm or deny his presence there, and quickly they dismissed it as a possibility. With little else to go on, Thomas Wright, the Mattoon Police Commissioner, contacted the Illinois Department of Public Safety on the morning of Wednesday, September the 6th, to ask for their help in solving the case. In response, the IDPS sent Superintendent Richard Piper of the Bureau of Criminal Identification Investigation along with his assistant, Francis Berry, to Mattoon to help them to get to the bottom of things. Piper and Berry arrived in town the very next day, along with two FBI agents from the local Springfield branch of the Bureau, who had showed up in order to identify the chemical that was being used in the so-called attacks. That night saw the police force bolstered by the first wave of vigilante volunteers, patrolling the streets with the small, official force of eight patrolmen, Women who were home alone, either through husbands away fighting in Europe or out working late shifts, began moving in to stay with friends and relatives through fear of their safety. Still, all remained quiet on the streets, and none of the police nor vigilante citizens discovered any prowlers. Back at the police station, however, there were numerous calls coming in, reporting sightings, though none were confirmed, and Chief Cole later chalked many of the calls up to bouts of nerves. Cole wasn't the only official to suggest that at least some of the reports may have been a result of nervous disposition. Richard Piper of the Bureau of Criminal Identification and Investigation had also suggested that he thought that only some of the reports had had any veracity, whilst many others were due to hysteria. If he felt that the hysteria needed to be controlled, however, then he had a funny way of showing it, as he then went on to tell the press that the case was the strangest in his career and that the anaesthetist was a crazed madman. Although the night had been quiet on the streets of Mattoon, with the vigilante forces discovering little in the way of interest related to the anaesthetist, the papers next day told a different story. Whilst men had walked their beats alongside police, the anaesthetist had struck several times throughout the night. Mad anaesthetist strikes again, visits two more homes in city during night. The anaesthetic prowler, who for a week has struck terror in the hearts of Mattoon residents, visited at least two more homes in this city Wednesday night and added two more victims, both women, to this growing list. At least two more homes was actually something of an understatement. The prowler had been awfully busy that Wednesday night. At 10pm, Laura Junkin, manager at the Big Four restaurant, was closing up and retiring to her small apartment situated at the rear of the restaurant premises. As she entered her bedroom, she noticed a smell reminiscent of what she described as a cheap perfume in the air and realised that she had left her window cracked about four inches open all day. She soon felt the familiar effects of the anaesthetic prowler's attacks as her legs fell numb and paralysis crept up towards her kneecaps whilst waves of nausea washed over her in the darkness of the room. 
Within an hour, Glenda Hendershot, the 11-year-old daughter of Mr. and Mrs. R.E. Hendershot, had woken suddenly due to sickness. When her parents called police, they noticed that just a short time prior to their daughter's waking, they had spotted a suspicious prowler near their daughter's window. At midnight, Mrs. Ardell Spangler was next to fall victim to the gasser. She had woken to sickly sweet fumes in her bedroom that had brought about nausea whilst her lips and throat burned from the gas. Again at 1am, Fred Goebel was the next to wake, feeling violently ill. He took to throwing up for the following two hours before his running with the man at Eastis began to fade. More interestingly, Fred's neighbour, Robert Daniels, had actually spotted a tall, thin man running through his yard from the direction of Goebel's house shortly after the attack had taken place. It didn't end there either. Before the night was over, the police took further reports from Mr. Daniel Spon, Mrs. Cody Taylor and Miss Maxine and Francis Smith, all who had felt the effects of gas in one way or another whilst they had slept. Francis Smith was the principal in the nearby Mattoon grade school and this was to be our first of several run-ins with the mad gasser, the next of which took place the very next night, after a troubled day of gossip and panic spreading throughout the town. As she lay in her bed along with her sister Maxine, the anaesthetist struck the Smith sisters for a second time. In their report, they spoke of a blue, smoke-like vapour coming in through their window and paralysis creeping up through their legs as they lay waiting for a burglary that never came. That Friday saw a scathing editorial in the local Mattoon daily paper, the Mattoon Journal Gazette. Mattoon's mad anaesthetist, the story of Mattoon's anaesthetic prowler, is known to one and all. It has even spread from one end of the country to the other, bringing the city a certain questionable distinction. Probably the only comfort we can get out of the whole situation is that our police department is now on the alert apparently doing everything in its powers to solve the case and take into custody the guilty person. All of us join in hoping for an early success. One of the principal difficulties throughout has been that the whole matter was taken too lightly. It was easy to say, oh, it's just imagination, and shrug the whole thing off with a disdainful air, but Mrs. Cordes, who suffered severe burns, couldn't laugh about it. Neither could Mrs. Kearney, who suffered complications which could have cost her her very life. For the past few days, most of our officers have had a serious view of the case. They now admit that it presents a real problem and are working hard to find a solution. For their present attitude, most members of the police force deserve commendation. As a matter of fact, their hesitancy in taking a genuine interest in the case at the start should not be considered a new reflection upon them. This is an attitude which has grown in the police department for several months. We suppose it is natural for the pride of policemen to be stung a bit when a crime is committed. For this reason, there has been a tendency in Mattoon police circles recently to conceal from the public the facts that certain crimes have occurred. Commissioner Thomas V. Wright, under the law, is supposed to be the top man of the police department and we doubt if Mattoon ever had a more conscientious servant than he has been in the capacity. He is a square shooter and would like nothing better than to give the city an excellent police force. Yet we strongly suspect that his efforts have been hampered by another city official. The latter should leave the direction of the police department to Commissioner Wright. Policemen who continue to take direction from the other official should be discharged at once and the entire city commission should support Commissioner Wright if he ever finds such action necessary. Whilst the paper's editorial weighed in with its own political bent on the affair, they also received letters from readers who summed up the general feeling in the town for ordinary residents. We used to think things only happened to those who were out on the streets or somewhere else outside of their homes, but now there is no safety, even in one's own home, with all the doors locked. There are hundreds of women here that are left at home at night, alone whilst their husbands are at work and in the service. I know one serviceman's wife who has a lovely home which she wanted to keep so her husband could come home to it but since so many terrible things have happened she is afraid to stay there with her little son. She is fortunate enough to have parents with whom to stay but those who have nowhere else to go 
just live in fear each night, waiting for daylight to come. That evening, Richard Piper, the superintendent of the Bureau of Criminal Identification Investigation from the IDPS, told the press in a conference, The perpetrator of the attacks must be mentally unbalanced, but he is intelligent, possibly brilliant. The man is a nut. After that bombastic speech, he perhaps sought to assuage the fears by reassuring the public that he probably wasn't a peeping Tom. The attacks on Mattoon started early that Friday evening, the first being perhaps the most unusual of all, and for once, appeared to lead to no victims suffering any adverse effect. Police were called to a home on DeWitt Avenue, just west from the very centre of town, when Leroy Cook, a taxi cab driver had reported pulling onto the street only to smell the gas so strongly that he was forced to pull over. The odour appeared to centre around the home of C.W. Driscoll, but when police entered his home, they smelt no gas inside any of the rooms. Though witnesses assured police that they could smell it on the street outside, outside the bedroom windows. Two hours later, on the far reaches of Western Mattoon, a small cul-de-sac known as Westwood perched away from the lights of the main town centre. Now swallowed up by the town, in 1944 it stood at the far perimeter boundary and was far out of the way from any usual foot traffic. Genevieve Haskell, her son, Mrs Russell Bailey and her sister, Catherine Tuzo, were all staying together in the large house in the -the out-of-the-way neighbourhood when the gas was struck through their open window. All members of the household woke simultaneously suffering from violent vomiting, stomach disorders and a parched mouth and throat. Later that night, the Smith residence was hit for the third time in as many nights. Frances Smith once again gave her report to the press, saying that just prior to smelling the flower-like gas, she heard a strange buzzing noise outside her window which she attributed to the madman's gassing apparatus. Things in Mattoon were nearing a frenzy level of panic when the next day, newspaper headlines went all in, calling the attacker the mad gasser for the first time. Police were still none the wiser as to what was going on and they appeared to have no suspects. Whilst in a further blow to the ongoing investigations, results of the cloth analysis found by Beulah Cordes on her porch were returned from the laboratory with negative results, as if apparition of the chemical had caused nothing but an inert, reddish-coloured stain to remain by the time that the tests were carried out. That Saturday and Sunday saw a flurry of attacks, despite once again the police patrols being bolstered by a host of local farmers armed with shotguns. First came a statement from Louis Hardin, who called the police to report an attack on his sister-in-law while she babysat for his son. The gas had come through an open window and led to the familiar nausea and burned throats. The second attack of the night was the furthest the gas had travelled from the centre of Mattoon by some distance, when County Sheriff Leroy Boggs was called out to a rural farmhouse four miles south of Mattoon, owned by Stuart Scott. Scott had called the sheriff after escaping the gas with his family and house guests to his nearby neighbours half a mile away. When police checked the house out, they found a window screen slashed open and left in tatters. Mary and Kenneth Fitzpatrick were next. The gasser had apparently returned to Central Mattoon and attacked the couple whilst they played cards into the late evening in their northwest Mattoon home. Finally, the gasser struck for a fourth and final time at the house of Francis and Maxine Smith, who by now were surely becoming accustomed to the effects of the gas. By this point, there was a constant group of upwards of a hundred people hanging around outside the City Hall building, demanding answers from authorities and at times chasing police cars as they left the building in order to find out what was going on for themselves. With reports in the paper suggesting upwards of 29 victims having been attacked, people were getting desperate for real, solid information concerning just what exactly it was that the police were doing yet the police still continued to give nothing to the public for reassurance. The brightest leads seemed to be reports that a chemistry set had gone missing from the Mattoon High School, which had held enough ingredients to make a quantity of mustard gas. 
As far as suspects went, police told newspapers that they were observing four Mattoon High School graduates who had recently returned from the army, though they were not forthcoming with any more details. In order to quell fears and stop matters getting out of hand, a force of five radio-fitted squad cars, each with two officers, were called in from Illinois State Police to swell the Mattoon police ranks and patrol the downtown area of Mattoon, freeing up the home officers to patrol the residential areas of the city. The newspapers on Monday morning, however, took a rather sharp turnabout face when the Mattoon Journal Gazette printed the headline, Many Prowler Reports, Few Real. Two women, one residing in the 2300 block of Champaign Avenue, the other in the 800 block of Moultrie Avenue, were taken to Memorial Hospital for treatment and examination after they told police that they had been attacked by the gas. The former woman claimed the attack had occurred at her home The other said she smelled the gas as she sat in a theatre. A physician who examined both women said that he could find no evidence of a poison gas or other chemical and that in his opinion both suffered from extreme nervous tension. Both women were given sedatives and taken to their homes. This report prompted Police Commissioner Thomas Wright to make an unprecedented move. He ordered in a public statement that from Monday onwards Anyone calling the police concerning a gas attack must submit themselves to the scrutiny of a doctor's examination immediately following an official report. Furthermore, the chasers who were milling around the City Hall building were told that if they did not desist in their following of police squad cars, they would find themselves promptly arrested. Unsurprisingly, the headline the next day in the Journal Gazette was, depending on how it was viewed, somewhat more positive. Mad Gasser case limited to four suspects. No more genuine attacks of anaesthetist reported. Was it the case that no more attacks had taken place, or were the victims held back from making official reports by the stigma of having to surrender to a physical examination with the very real possibility of being outed as a fraud or a hysterical fool with a nervous disposition by the following day's paper? The report in the papers followed instead the four suspects that the police had under observation. The police had begrudgingly furnished the public with a single further detail due to a leak that had been published in a Chicago-based newspaper the day before. Keeping things as tight-lipped as they could, the public statement mentioned only that two of the four suspects were amateur chemists, a hobby that was remarkably popular in the 1940s. The only attack that had happened on Monday night was apparently on a woman who had been taken to the doctor's office after her report had been given and diagnosed with extreme mental anguish. The following day, Tuesday the 12th of September, the papers carried a story in which the chief of police, Cole, called the entire Mattoon gas attack case a mistake from beginning to end. Local police, in cooperation with state officers, have checked and rechecked all reported cases, said Chief Cole and we find absolutely no evidence to support the stories that have been told. Hysteria must be blamed for such seemingly accurate statements of supposed victims. However, we have found that large quantities of carbon tetrachloride are used in the war work down at the Atlas Imperial Diesel Company plant, and that it has an odour which could be carried in all parts of the city as the wind shifts. It also leaves stains on cloth, such as those found on a rag at the Cordes home. In contradicting statements, Chief of Police Cole seemed to be publicly stating that the entire affair was a nonsense, but even so, that the gas did exist. Further, he also seemed, rather alarmingly, to be suggesting that gas carried on the wind to all extremities of the city from a factory on 14th Street and Broadway in the centre of town could somehow concentrate itself onto a square of cloth slightly larger than the average handkerchief. To any sane reader, it was clear that the mistake was not the case of the Phantom Gasser, but Cole's bizarre press release. Unamused by the insinuation that his factory was to blame for the mad gasser of Mattoon attacks, Mr Webster, the manager of Atlas Imperial Diesel Company factory, struck back at Cole, assuring him that the very idea was a complete fabrication and utterly ridiculous. He then drafted in a State Department of Health official to file a report saying conclusively that the plant was in no way related to the gas attacks. 
The only place that carbon tetrachloride was used at all in the factory was, in fact, securely contained inside fire extinguishers. In a statement taken over the telephone from the State Department's Dr. Cronenberg, Cole's theory was shot down with little fuss. There was no possibility of trichlorothyrene vapours getting into the outside atmosphere in any amount or concentration that would even closely approximate a toxic condition. In what was quickly falling into a farce, the front page of the Wednesday Journal Gazette carried a photograph of a gang of farmers carrying shotguns through the night streets of Mattoon with the caption, Mattoon Willow the Wisp. The farmers were stated to be on the trail of the phantom anaesthetist who sprayed his victims with gardenia gas. The headline stated police got two false alarms during the night, attempted break-in. The break-in, it transpired, as the paper's story unfolded, was actually a case of a local doctor who had forgotten his door keys and had been caught breaking into his own home. Backtracking once again, Cole stated that the fumes may not have originated at the Atlas factory and now stated that it could have come from any one of the local factories. Still, if Coles' intent had been to make a mockery of the entire affair and divert attention away from the case or shame those who did believe in the presence of an attacker into submission, he was having results. By midweek, the crowd surrounding City Hall had evaporated away and all the stories in the papers were suggesting the whole thing as an elaborate fraud or hoax. The Chicago Daily Chronicle spoke of normalcy returning to the city as the local police sought to bury the phantom gasser in a mythical cemetery. As the week rolled on towards its conclusion, so too did the mad anaesthetist case reach its end. The squad cars drafted into patrol downtown Mattoon were sent back, one by one, and extra patrolmen too were stood down. Eventually, the case, at least in the public eye, fell to silence and the case quietly closed, with little to no resolution. So just what did happen in Mattoon over the two weeks in early September? Was there a gasser, or was it all just hysteria? Despite being called one of the most bizarre cases the authorities could recall, they in fact would not have had to go too far back to have discovered the cases of mad gassers were not quite as uncommon as one might have imagined. Given the fairly extreme words of the authorities during the height of the mad gasser affair in Mattoon, one would be forgiven for thinking that the phantom gas attacks were a rarity. In truth, you only need to look back a matter of months before you find another case with certain similarities. In February of 1944, the small town of Coatesville, Pennsylvania, not dissimilar in size and social makeup to Mattoon, saw a case whereby a family escaped their house in the middle of the night after waking and smelling a sweet-smelling gas. Their neighbours were not so fortunate, however, and the mystery gas led to John and Myrtle Refford, along with their brother Charles, being found dead from asphyxiation by police later that evening. Neighbours on either side of the Refford home escaped without injury, and whilst there were no more attacks, the presence of sweet-smelling mystery grass pricks ears after hearing of the Mattoon affair. If we were to go back a further ten years to the end of 1933, a second case is discovered to have taken part in Botatou County, Virginia. Attacks using sweet-smelling gas began on the evening of December the 22nd, 1933 in Fincastle and continued up until February of 1934 throughout various towns and villages including Troutville, Cloverdale, Owls Mill, Pleasantdale, Bonsack and Carvin's Cove. In much the same fashion as Mattoon, the official and press approach to the goings-on initially zeroed in on a crazed attacker, only to make a dramatic U-turn and claim that the whole thing had been nothing more than an elaborate series of hoaxes and hysteria. In an almost direct prelude to Mattoon, headlines read from the familiar mysterious gas attacks and even included a sceptical police force who doubts the genuineness of many cases and ascribes them to hysteria. So were these cases all just figments of the imagination? Clearly real damage and harm was being done, but was it all simply the power of the mind and the overwhelming ability of fear and anxiety to cause physical effects on the body? Just months after the Mattoon attacks ended, Dr Donald Johnson, at the time a student at the University of Illinois, 
shown up in Matoum with an eye to carry out a study on the attacks, the results of which were published in a paper titled The Phantom Anaesthetist of Matoum, A Field Study of Mass Hysteria. This was included within the Journal of Abnormal and Social Psychology in January of 1945. In short, the paper suggested that the blanket coverage of local newspapers within Mattoon went some way into stirring up a level of anxiety and fear that led to the population of Mattoon to suffer from a mental epidemic. Johnson argued that there was never any gas from the start and that its existence in any capacity was highly improbable. In order to produce effects of the kind reported when sprayed through a window, the gas would have to be a very potent, stable anaesthetic with rapid action and at the same time so unstable that it would not affect others in the same room. It would have to be strong enough to produce vomiting and paralysis and yet leave no observable after effects. Study of a standard source on anaesthetics and war gases and consultation with medical and chemical colleagues at the University of Illinois indicates that the existence of such a gas is highly improbable. Chemists are extremely sceptical of the possibility that such an extraordinary gas could be produced by some mad genius working in a basement. After the publication of the paper, mass hysteria became the accepted answer to Mattoon's troubles, at least for those outside of the town, with symptoms ranging from dizziness and nausea occurring in 40 to 45% of victims right down to paralysis, which occurred in 10%, it all appeared to fit well enough for the academics of the day to call Mattoon case closed. With contemporary academics, press and even officials publicly stating that it was all just a figment of a town with an overactive imagination, that seemed to be that. Police Commissioner Thomas Wright believed that a gasser had existed, but ultimately, his final words on the case were that the whole thing had been a hysteria. There is no doubt that a gas maniac exists and has made a number of attacks, but many of the reported attacks are nothing more than hysteria. Fear of the gas man is entirely out of proportion to the menace of the relatively harmless gas he is spraying. The whole town is sick with hysteria. Proponents of this mass hysteria theory have over the years pointed out that until the Journal Gazette printed its headline of an anaesthetic prowler, there was in fact no mention nor evidence of a person related to the tax at all, just a sweet smell in the air. The paper had simply put two and two together and came up with the story that had struck a chord of fear into the population already softened to the idea of gas attacks through science fiction and further heightened by the ongoing war with Germany. If it seems absurd that Americans should have been afraid of invasion from a country that died halfway across the world, Consider the bombardment of the propaganda and advertisements in the papers for the not so subtly named invasion or liberty bonds that warned readers of a Hun invasion of the homeland. Another key fact that is often pointed out to was the tagline to the very first headline that read First Victims, suggesting that there must of course be more to follow. Mattoon became something of a self-fulfilling prophecy cooked up by a copywriter with an overly dramatic newspaper headline. The paper built the story up and took the town into a tailspin of fear, only to tear it back down weeks later, putting an end to the entire affair just as quickly as it had started it. And with that, the case of the mad gasser of Mattoon was wrapped up, only to be trotted out in psychology textbooks as a staple case of mass hysteria, or what's known more commonly today as mass psychogenic or sociogenic illness. But what are the numerous other, less accepted theories? Other theories of the mad gasser of Mattoon range from the somewhat understandable, in the case of there actually being a gasser on the loose, to the downright absurd, including multi-dimensional ape-like beings attacking residents with spray guns. In the case for a mad gasser being an actual physical attacker, there is some amount of evidence. Belula Cordes found the rag on the porch, though the skeleton key and lipstick tube that she also seemed to find both seemed like items potentially dropped or cast away by anyone. In at least two of the cases, window screens were slashed and torn by the supposed attacker in the process of the gassing. A woman's footprint was found in one flower bed by one of the open windows, and for those that put forward such a case, 
the abrupt about turn face in the media is generally considered to be a move involving a police cover-up of sorts, whereby the police, cracking under the pressure of a public needing answers, a town on the edge of rioting, and a case with nothing but dead ends, led officials in Mattoon to, to push a narrative criticising the population for stirring up a series of hoaxes or suffering from hysteria in order to cause stigma and embarrassment for anyone making police reports. The direct correlation of the fall in official reports of attacks and Chief Cole's statement that any victims must admit themselves to a physical examination is something that many point to as an example of police bullying a victimised population into keeping quiet. One of the most enduring questions is just how abruptly did the attacks end in Mattoon? Was it, as the paper suggested, almost overnight? Or was it simply that reports disappeared underground, discussed amongst friends and in local gossip, but no longer officially reported? The psychology paper written by Dr. Donald Johnson actually infers that victims became critical of their imagination, leading to fewer reports to police. But this too could be flipped on its head and used against the case of hysteria. If the stigma was enough to suppress a victim's imagination, then surely it was also enough to suppress a victim's official statement to police. Furthermore, when Dr. Johnson came to Mattoon, he was not shy about his reasons to undertake the study, and as such, no residents were forthcoming with information for a doctor who wanted to paint the town as a collection of nervous wrecks. This led him to being unable to interview any of the victims themselves and only able to speak to the police department. And what of the four suspects that the police were apparently monitoring? No names were ever given to the police, but in his book, The Mad Gasser of Mattoon, Dispelling the Hysteria, author Scott Maruna suggests a local man by the name of Farley Llewellyn as the primary suspect. Though, frankly, his theory is so abysmal and full of conjecture and cliché profiling that to waste my breath on it any more than this would be a disservice to you listening at home. One of the most questionable theories suggests that Mattoon was part of a wider conspiracy involving the Coatesville attacks from earlier in the year, orbiting around the central idea of a government attempting to test chemical weapons on its own population, though naturally, evidence for this is non-existent. Equally as out there as Maruna's Farley theory or the idea of a conspiracy is the suggestion that the gasser was an interdimensional ape-like humanoid creature with a spray gun which, bizarrely enough, does have its roots in a true report, placed by one Edna James, a long-term resident of Mattoon, who had worked both as a local innkeeper and town fortune teller. Her story follows that she woke on the night of the 7th of September to noises coming from her kitchen, which when she went to see what was going on, led her to discover an ape-like man with stooped shoulders exceedingly long arms and facial warts. When the strange creature spotted her in the room alongside him, he let out an unrecognisable series of grunts and then doused her with his spray gun, which caused paralysis. Several days later, she claimed to see him again, casually walking across her inn lobby, though naturally she was the only person in the room able to see the creature. When he noticed Edna looking at him, he disappeared into thin air. Hairy ape men aside, one of the last, often repeated, and certainly more grounded theories suggests that toxic waste or pollution from the nearby factories could have been the culprit. Though it's fairly well documented that at least the Atlas Diesel Engine Company plant could be safely ruled out of that one, and this theory doesn't explain any of the witness accounts of intruders, condensed plumes of gas, nor torn window screens. In the end, the mad gasser of Mattoon likely falls to just two theories. There either was an attacker patrolling the town, gassing victims with a somewhat harmless gas for no apparent motive other than to strike fear into the population, or there was not, and the entire event was cooked up by the press and ran thoroughly out of hand. The answer could also, of course, lay somewhere in the grey area between the two. Now simply a legend, the answers are frustratingly buried alongside any living memories of these attacks of Mattoon in September of 1944. So that's the full story of the mad gasser of Mattoon. It's, uh, yeah, it's a really interesting story, and it's one of those stories that I'd heard of the 
title and you know i'd heard of the mad gasser of matoon but i just never really looked into the details of it so it was really interesting to get into and there's quite a lot to unpack for this one i think actually like in a discussion sort of format so i'm going to come back after this break and talk through my thoughts at least anyway um and see if they align with yours be back after these short ads that you're probably tired of skipping by now thanks for listening to dark histories This podcast is entirely independent and funded by myself and listener support. So in order to do that, I need to run a few ads. Our long-time advertising partner is Audible. And the reason I've stuck with them for so long is that they offer a service that I actually use and enjoy myself. And I do think it actually offers value to people like myself who enjoy podcasts. If you're unaware of what Audible is, it's an audiobook subscription service which charges a monthly fee in return for one credit, which you're free to spend on any audiobook you like. The catalogue is huge, multilingual, and covers everything from fiction to series of lectures. They have an iOS, Android and web app, and if you use more than one, they all sync up together so that you can listen on any of your devices without having to skip about. If you ever feel like you want to take a break from the subscription, you can do so and you get to keep all your previously bought books. And when you get into a drought, you can just fire it up again and start gaining credits seamlessly. Some of my favourite books on there to date are The Complete Sherlock Holmes, which is read by Stephen Fry. And they've also got the original Exorcist book and just a huge history back catalogue. And I've really enjoyed all of those, basically. So if this sounds like something you might be interested in, head over to audible.com forward slash dark histories. And that's dark histories all one word. And you can start a free trial that offers a monthly subscription with one free credit so that you can instantly pick an audiobook of your choice. If at the end of the trial, you feel like it's not really for you, you can just cancel it and it's cost you nothing and you get to keep your free book. So once again, that's audible.com forward slash dark histories. Or you can find the link in the show notes. So earlier I mentioned listener support and there are a ton of ways that you can get involved and support Dark Histories. The main way is to become a Patreon patron. If you listen to a lot of podcasts, I'm sure you're familiar by now. But for those not so much, Patreon is a way to make a monthly pledge in return for some small perks. On the Dark Histories Patreon, I set my pledges as low as I can, really, with options for one, three, and five dollars per month. And for that, you gain things like early access episodes without these horrible ads, PDF notes, and resources that I make and find during my research for each episode. There's also access to the live stream archives and more. So if you enjoy the show and you think it's worth it to you, hop over to darkhistories.com. And you can find all the ways that you can support, including our Patreon, or just check out the links in the show notes. If none of that appeals, then sharing it around with all your friends and family is equally as helpful and just as much appreciated. So if you're here, then thanks so much for not skipping the ads with that 30 second skip button and giving my hard sell a listen. I'll let you get back to the episode. Cheers. Welcome back. I mean, where to start? I'll tell you what, I'll lay out what I think um, and, and you can see if it aligns with what you think. Uh, and of course, if you want to get in touch and let me know your theories, you're, I'm always happy to read people's theories. Definitely go ahead and do that. I, I think I'm probably somewhere in the middle. I think that's the, the sanest position is somewhere in the middle where there, there probably was a tax in fact, I, I, I think almost definitely there was a tax. And, I, and I'll explain why in a minute. But I do think also that there was a pretty large level of hysteria going on. And I think that can probably explain a lot of the attacks. So I think it's somewhere in the middle there. And um, the reason I think there definitely was a tax was there were some physical injuries. And I don't think you could get those from hysteria. Like, like all the rest of it, the lightheadedness, paralysis vomiting, nausea, I think that could all have been attributed to extreme anxiety. I mean, anyone who suffered panic attacks or whatever would tell you that they felt all of those things. So, you know, I, I definitely think that it could have been, that could be hysteria, but but there were a few other symptoms that just don't really fit with that. Like that woman, um, Balula Cordes, had 
bleeding lips and swollen. They were all swollen and red and that. And the newspaper actually said that the, the reporter had witnessed, like, you know, her lips were battered the next day. So, you know, she there were definitely other physical effects that it had had. Uh, so I think that's pretty strong evidence that something was going on. And I also think that, that there was times when two people were spotted although they could have been attempting robberies and things like that um but but there was there was definitely somebody stalking around one one of the slightly more frustrating things is is the fact that the police had caught that guy shortly after the first attack like one of the very first attacks and he said that he was lost now i seen a map of mattoon i mean i spent the last week with a map of Mattoon and putting pins in it for all the attacks, um, which I'll, again I'll come to in a minute. But it's not a big town. It's it, it's really not. And I I can't see how you would get lost there if you were a resident. It does, I suppose it doesn't say if he was like an outsider. And if you're an outsider, I guess you could get lost. But if you're an outsider, what are you doing walking around a residential suburb? More than likely you would be... Or there's a high probability that you would probably be in the centre of town, right? There's there's less of a possibility that you would be in the suburb, unless I suppose you were visiting people. But the, the, annoyingly, the, 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 the police report and the newspaper doesn't go into detail that heavily. They just said that he said that he was lost and they let him go. I suppose he was, or you know, came across genuine enough. But I I, I think that's so. I still think that's quite suspicious because it was say a small town. And to talk about that, so there are a lot of attacks and they're all over the place. And when I was reading it, I was reading on newspapers and, and really great, uh, probably you couldn't get away with doing this these days, you know, like privacy laws and stuff. They give you the name and address of like every single person they're talking about. So I plotted on the map all of the attacks because I thought, uh, basically I was checking the map after when I would read them. And I thought, this seems to me like they're all over the place. And and it seems like a long way to be travelling, so that's why I looked up, you know, how big Matoon was, and the, the, and got a a map with a scale on it, so I could check, and and I started pinning all the attacks, and I pinned them all out, and they they're, they're not there's no logic. I was a bit annoyed because at first I was pinning them out, and I was like, oh, hang on, you know, this is starting to create a, a, a kind of cluster, and and. If you've done it this before, you basically you, you pin them out and then you look in the center of that cluster and that tends to be where you can sort of begin to narrow your search if you're the police or whatever. That's what they would have done. They would have plotted it out and then if they created like a circle, for example, they would look within that circle. Somewhere in the center would be where they would be looking, you know, to start centering the search for where someone might live or whatever. And it started creating this kind of circle. And I was like, oh, but then it started going all over the place. And by the end of it, they were just dotted throughout my tomb, like all over the place. It, but it's, I say it's not a big place. I, I think on foot, some of the attacks you may have been hard pressed to have done. It, it seems like, because this, I thought, answers the question as to whether or not it was real attacks or whether or not it was hysteria. Or I suppose it at least places it in the middle. Because if there's, for example, one attack, um, in the far eastern part of the city, let's say, and there's attack five minutes later in the far western, you, you know that at least one of those is probably not real, right? If not both, but at least one is a fabrication or hysteria. But the thing is, is all the attacks seem to be like 30 minutes to an hour apart. And I would say, with at least if you can drive, that would be no problem. Even to get the four miles down south to the farmhouse and then back up to the northwest Mattoon within an hour, perfectly doable, like in a car. I think on foot it gets a little bit more difficult. But then you start questioning well, if they had a car, surely the police were savvy enough to that and, and would have noticed a car continuing to show up around areas that were getting attacks, but, but maybe not, I don't know. I say, I think if he was on foot, I still think he could have done it anyway. But I think if he was on foot, it leads to one or two of the attacks being slightly unfeasible. But but largely, I think they would have been possible. So that was interesting. I, I do think, like I say, like looking at it like this and, and, and really kind of breaking it down and 
charting out the map like I did and everything. I did feel like that there probably was a tax. I, I just don't think it could have all been hysteria. I think it there were things that just didn't seem to fit like that for me. Plus, annoyingly, and, and what I find really annoying, is everyone in this writes it from their own perspective. So probably the best book on this, and I call it the best book, it, it's the bad, the best of a bad bunch. Um, but one of the best kind of books that lays out the story in, in a chronological order that's just for the average reader, it's not an academic piece, for example, is that one by Scott Maruna. And that it's not a great book. Um, I, I wouldn't bother, to be honest, if I was you. Um, and he very much pushes his theory, which is that there was a mad guesser. But he very much is behind that. And he ignores some things which show him to be dishonest, in my opinion. But it works both ways because Johnson, the guy who wrote the paper, also ignored some things. And there's another smaller book, that's, I'd say it's more like a pamphlet, actually, um, that, that talks about this story that I read. And that, that one was kind of on the side of the mass hysteria. And it ignored... Basically, everything seemed to ignore facts that were clearly printed and that they knew were printed because I, I could see they were they were quoting articles that the facts were in, but they were ignoring them. So they were just ignoring these facts to suit their own agendas, and it, it really annoyed me. There's not a single resource on this that's legit as far as I can see. You've got to read them all and then piece it all together from there, I think, and, and try to be a bit more critical about it because every single source or resource seems to have an agenda and I, and I dislike it and it, the, it's okay to have an agenda but you've got to be honest and 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 they're not they're all pushing an agenda and ignoring details uh, to give you an example of it one of the pieces that I read that was suggesting it was mass hysteria was said you know if if, if there really was a mad gas room people really were scared why were they not leaving their homes they are all just going back to sleep well, they weren't. There's numerous, numerous places it's pointed out that people were moving in with their relatives, moving into kind of cluster together. And after attacks, victims who had had an attack had then moved to like a, a relative's house to stay the night or whatever. So that was wrong, you know. And, 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 and this is just one small thing, but there's a lot of these that, that say, I'm just giving this an example. Like, but every, everyone who writes a book on this, does something very similar and they ignore little details like that that I'm almost convinced they know but they just don't fit their narrative so they don't include them and I, and I so yeah this is a difficult case to kind of dig down you've just got to be very critical but Scott Maruna I mean I, I blasted his theory a little bit and I, I said I didn't want to give it any credit it's really bad um it's like my first crime solving 101 by Scott Maruna he he profiles this guy, basically says, oh, you know, there's evidence that he was possibly gay and therefore bullied at high school, which he just comes to that conclusion. Um, you know, and, and he was a recluse and he had social problems and he was a smart genius who lived it. And it, it's, I mean, you can already feel how cringe this is, right? And it, it gets worse, you know, because he later says that the, this Farley guy, couldn't have done all the attacks, basically. So his his theory isn't really lining up. So he brings in the fact that he had two sisters that could have carried on the attacks for him, like they would, like it would become a family affair. Like, what on earth are you on about? It, it's really a theory that I read, and it was insulting to my intelligence. It was it was really bad. I, I say I found it disgraceful, and, I, and I'll leave it there. It was really sort of, basic um pick on the guy who may be socially not quite normal and you know may have mental health issues uh and and let's like basically use that as an excuse to claim him as our like that's that's all he had basically and it, and it's it's really bad um so yeah i'll leave that there if you really want to read his theory i think his book is actually online it's called the mad gasser of mattoon dispelling hysteria um, Scott Maruna Swamp Gas Book Company. It's really not worth looking up, though. But yeah, otherwise, I thought some of the theories were pretty cool. 
I can see the conspiracy theory straight away. Well, there's two, there's kind of two conspiracy theories, isn't there? The first one is the really big conspiracy that it was the American government testing gas on their own citizens. I don't know if I can buy that. that that's, that that's, a, that's a bit too much of a leap for me. Plus, all it's really doing is linking Coatesville with Mattoon because it happened in the same year. And, and because Coatesville killed an entire house, they're saying that it was like it had gone wrong that time. It was because they were trying to test a gas that would kind of disable people um, for a short period. And, that, and they say that that one was, you know, it was obviously too strong because it killed an entire household. So they sort of knocked that test on the head early and got out so they wouldn't be discovered. And then they went on to start do another test in Mattoon a few months later. So that's that conspiracy theory. I, I can't really buy that, to be honest. So it's, that, that's just a little bit too... It's, it's a fun theory, but it's a little bit too much of a leap for me. Um, and to say that the other conspiracy theory, which I, I suppose is a, sort of a conspiracy theory, which I actually think is, is a lot less out there, is that the police were just simply having trouble and that wasn't helped by the hysteria in the town. It wasn't helped by the newspapers leaking everything. It wasn't helped by people chasing the police cars. Everything was a nightmare. They had no leads to go on. Everyone was calling them out. You know, the streets were getting pretty close to getting lively. You had, like, gatherings outside the city hall and people were not very happy. And then all of a sudden they seemed to start controlling this narrative of, you know, it's all just hysteria, don't worry about it. And, and or not, don't worry about it so much as that, that I, I do feel like there, there was a bullying element to it. You know, it was almost like this is all just crazy. If if you want to do any more reports, you've got to submit to a police report, um, a doctor's examination, rather. And the problem with that is the newspapers were then in their narrative shaping those people as, you know, idiots or, or somehow kind of negatively. And the police kind of definitely helped shape that narrative. So there's that kind of conspiracy that the police were kind of trying to dig themselves out of a hole and cover up their own inag- inadequacies. So I guess that's sort of a conspiracy. I can sort of see that. I, I I don't necessarily think that's like the whole story, but I think you could tie a little a little smidge of that. Like if you want to make a recipe out of it, it would be like a a, a smidgen of of that sort of conspiracy and a kind of bit of the idea that there was a gasser and a bit of the idea that there was a hysteria and I think you mix that all up and stick it in the oven and I think out comes this story that is a dreadful analogy wasn't it but you get the get the idea I think it's a bit of all of these I love the theory about the interdimensional ape like creature <laughs> who sprays a spray gun at people with facial warts he it, it was brilliant but yes, um, obviously, I don't give that much capacity at all. But I loved it. I, I love the fact that it exists. It it has to have got in there, doesn't it? So, so yeah, that that's my theories, really, and thoughts on the Mad Gasser. There, so there were a lot of things. There was a couple. Uh, one last thing I did. I, the Balula Cordes, the handkerchief. I mean, a couple of things with that. I mean, for starters, the police saying that the police, the gas could be coming from a factory, and condense its way onto a handkerchief like that is absurd. <laughs> but, you know, that, that's an interesting one. Like, where did the handkerchief come from? Um, and then, but I don't think the things that she found, like, so there were, th- really there was like three clues in this whole case that the police had and, and that was it. And it was the skeleton key, the lipstick, and there was a women's footprint from a, a relatively flat shell flat soled heeled shoe um, in one of the flower beds outside a window from one of the attacks. Now, what's interesting about that is there was the same footprint, a, a, a relatively flat soled heeled shoe from a women's footprint on one of the other attacks, the, um, the, the one in the same year from the different town. That's quite interesting. But I think all three of them sadly can be explained. I mean, I think the key and the lipstick case, I think that's just junk on the floor. I'm not sure that really has anything to do with anything, but you could, I suppose, at least link the lipstick and the women's footprint and could say that the mad gasser was a woman, um, which would be an interesting twist. But you could also say that the footprint 
was just one of the housewives watering the plants or pulling the weeds or whatever and they're just being a footprint it doesn't necessarily have to be from that evening right so i think all three of the main clues you can see where the police were kind of stuck because the main that's all they really picked up and they had nothing to go on sadly they, they didn't seem to do any kind of tests on the lipstick or the key so yeah that that, that i guess that's that um Anyway, I think that's all I was going to say about this one. Um, there's loads to talk about. This will be coming up in the live stream in a few weeks when we do the live stream at the end of the month. If you want to get in touch and, and, and let me know your thoughts on it or anything, if you want to get in touch and tell me anything you like, please do so. Uh, you can have email contact at darkhistories.com or I, I am actually having trouble with um, emails quite a bit. But you can get in touch with me also through any social media and that, that seems to be a, a kind of more solid way to go. Um, that's Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, more or less dark histories on all those. It's some, some it's sort of dark underscore histories. Basically the one with the butterfly. And if you don't want to search it and you just want a link, hop over to darkhistories.com and you'll find links to literally everything on that website, the merch shop, Patreon and how you can go about supporting different ways, the various ways that you can support there's also links to like how to do the live stream, how to get on the live stream, the things you need to partake in the live stream, links to our Discord, um, which is a really nice place to hang out. There's also ways you can contact me through the Discord. And there's if you want to leave questions and stuff that we can discuss on the live stream, you can do that over on Discord as well. There's a whole channel dedicated to that now. Um, so basically... You really, if you if you want to get in touch any way, shape or form, support any way, shape or form, your best bet, darkhistories.com, you'll find everything there. It's like a portal to everything. Um, of course, there's also show notes and I'm kind of waffling now. So thank you very much for listening. I will see you in a couple of weeks. Take care. Have a great couple of weeks. I'll see you, say, in a couple of weeks. Thanks very much. Sleep tight.